Hi, before I begin this presentation, I just want to make sure that I'm giving credit where it's due. Maurice Rahme, my collaborator, is entirely responsible for all the developments on the simulation and reinforcement learning side of this project. He's also been an equal collaborator on designing the PCB and also the mechanical development. He was unable to join this presentation because I was giving this as an internal talk at my workplace, but it's important that I note that his work is behind all the gate modulation techniques that I discuss in the video, which are the very backbone of this project. He's created his own software package for controlling the robot, which has actually what inspired me to rewrite my own in ROS. This project would not have been possible without his contributions, and I consider my partnership with him to be one of the best things that came out of this project. I have linked his portfolio in the description of the video, and I highly recommend you check it out. He's a truly cool and inspirational guy. All right, enjoy the presentation. So um, I'm Adam. Uh, I am currently a UC Berkeley EECS freshman, so electrical engineering and computer science. And I'm at Forum Labs because I'm a software intern on the FLNC team, so Forum Labs, or sorry, at Southern North Carolina. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, one of my quarantine projects, which has been a 3D printed quadruped. Uh, and I guess it's a pretty good uh, segue to explain why am I even talking about a quadruped at Forum Labs right now. Um, and besides the fact that it's like 3D printed, um, I think it's, it's probably beneficial to go over like on a high level and a low level what it can do. Because like most robotics projects, there's a lot of parallels between them. Um, and so on a high level, you know, the, the robot can manipulate itself in XYZ trans in terms of uh, XYZ translation and then y'all pitch roll rotation. Um, and that's in one of these GIFs, they kind of repeat the different clips. Um, and it can also, you know, combine any of those. So it could do like an XYZ translation and uh, the all pitch roll, like all in conjunction. It involves intuitive gate generation. Now that just basically means like to make the robot walk, you don't have to like manually time or like have like an array of all the positions and like have it go to those interplay between those positions, um, but rather there's a little bit of intuition to it, which makes it a lot easier to tune. And then there's foot force sensing in a pretty cool way using a flexible filament and linear hall effect sensors and, uh, um, and magnets. And then on a lower level, um, it involves a full leg inverse kinematic model. So including accounting for offsets, um, two different ways to generate the foot trajectory. So either Bezier curves or quintic Kermite spline, depending on what exactly you're trying to achieve. Um, and then also, I mean, this, this one's a little bit further away from like what Form Labs is primarily interested in, but uh, a little bit of reinforcement learning uh, trained via simulation to uh, dynamically balance uh, via IMU input. And there's a few more things that I'll discuss in the end, um, but really just this is just meant to be like an overview of the project. And if you feel like any of it is relatively pertinent to Form Labs, please feel free to let me know and I can elaborate in the same part. Can I just say, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to yeah, make these chocolate. So cool. I learned to bake these chocolate crinkle cookies over quarantine. So, you know, I'm doing okay over here too. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and so I, before I even delve into like the base level of the project, you know, what it looks like mechanically on software, et cetera, I thought maybe I should give a little context as to like, what was the project before this and really why did I decide to pursue a quadruped? And so, you know, the very beginning of quarantine, the first few weeks, I felt like I had a lot of free time. So I, I decided to, create a differential drivetrain since that was the robotics platform I was most used to. And really some of the governing characteristics about this uh, drivetrain or, you know, drivetrain in general that made it like a really cool first little, I mean not first, but like a fun little project is that firstly it's statically stable. So like if I shut off the motors, the thing won't self-destruct, it won't break itself. It'll just stay there. Um, I don't have to worry about like dynamically balancing it. Uh, in terms of like system dynamics, it's relatively simple. I mean, stepper motors are very well characterized. Even if I use brushed motors or brushless motors, they're very, very well ca characterized and they have very simple equations that govern their dynamics. And then in terms of control theory, it's like insanely simple. Like if I want to turn right, I just make one side go faster than the other. If I want to turn left, make the other side go faster. I want to go backwards, just reverse them both. It's not, not difficult at all. And in terms of motion planning, it's highly intuitive. So like most people know like the fastest Point, you know, the fastest way to get between two points is a straight line. But once you start constraining your starting pose and your end pose, and you want to have acceleration and deceleration, um, it's pretty, you know, relatively intuitive to see how you end up with something like this quintic chromite spline trajectory. And so the goal for this project was this. I wanted to be able to select as many points as I wanted, and then I wanted it to find a path between those points and then um, trajectorify that path so that it has acceleration, deceleration, and obeys the 
system constraints of acceleration and maximum velocity, et cetera. And I mean, it ended up being able to do that. If you're interested in this project, it's not too complex. You can just click on this link and it uh, links to my portfolio. Um, and so <laughs> the reason I bring these three points up is because the robot dog uh, pretty much violates every single one of these. Um, it is neither statically stable. So if I shut off all the motors, I mean, there's, there's various definitions for static stability, but pretty much if I shut off the motors, it's gonna fall and break itself. Um, the motors themselves, like the servos, are relatively simple. They're also governed by pretty simple equations because they're just DC motors at heart, uh, or brush motors at heart. But when you when you had 12 of them that all need to work in conjunction, so 12 degrees of freedom that need to work in conjunction to move a singular body, it becomes pretty complicated to even wrap your head around, you know, what, what how do I make this walk like a step forward? Um, and then in terms of motion planning, the abstracted motion planning in terms of like path generation is, is also pretty much the same, you know, thread here. It's quintic for my spline for uh, planning, a, planning a path, um, but actually making the legs do what you want them to do so it can walk is a whole nother beast in and of itself. And so um, mechanically speaking, um, the heart of the system are the legs. That's what I spend the most time designing. Um, I mean, I started this in the beginning of quarantine, so before I knew I'd have a form labs internship. And so uh, I optimized the design for FDM printing. So lots of flat sides, minimal overhangs. Um, it's not really optimized for SLA or in form three's case, LFS. Um, but I did print one clear in the bottom right, which I think is the coolest model print I've ever done. Um, and then, cause you can see all the pulleys and stuff. Uh, if I had known it, I would have I had access to a fuse. I would have definitely like like made things <laughs> work within each other like a lot more. I would have pocketed because the fuse parts are a little denser. Um, and the main reason I went really for three D printing aside from accessibility <laughs> is uh, that I can I can do things like have integrated pulleys. You'll see if I slide in a little bit more, the leg has an integrated pulley. I can make custom pulleys for custom reductions. I could you know, transfer power in a very compact manner, as you can see in the upper leg, from like the upper leg to the you know, wrist or the elbow. And so it was, it was just, it made sense to use 3D printing. And one of my main design goals, mechanically speaking, was to, I had many iterations of this, at least three or four, like main uh, actual design iterations of the leg. Um, and I wanted to keep the moment of force minimal. So I wanted to reduce the weight at the bottom of the leg or like from this side, because the hip motor, um, would strain when you have all that weight out there. Um, and so I wanted to reduce the torque on that, that motor. So that's why I moved the, the wrist servo up here and then used a belt to uh, uh, its transmission. Now, electrically speaking, it's pretty simple. I made this little PCB, um, pretty much just a breakout board for a TNC, which is just like a super smart uh, or super powerful Arduino. Um, just a whole bunch of uh, PWM pinouts for the servos and then a couple of like I2C C and serial interfaces. Um, yeah, I, I have a Jetson in on here because I wanted to play around with machine learning and reinforcement learning, and, and I really didn't want to be constrained by Raspberry Pi. Um, but so far, I haven't even like reached a quarter of its limits. So um, maybe a Raspberry Pi could have been a uh, replacement here. Um, now, in terms of software infrastructure, I actually, the funny thing is I implemented everything in Python, and I like wrote my own like serial interface. Um, like it would just send raw like angles over to the, the TNC. Um, and then I found out about Ross um, and I just like rewrote all of it because it was so nice. Um, and so I, I, I rewrote everything in Ross. And so the way Ross operates are in nodes. So each of these little blocks is a node. I won't really go into detail about like the actual software infrastructure, but all the Jets and Nano nodes are Python and then all the TNC uh, nodes are in C++. So, um, a Jetson Nano is responsible for like all like the main processes, like planning movement, planning footpaths, um, synchronizing footpaths so that they follow a gate. And then the TNC LLC or that, that low level controller board that I, I showed that I made um, is really responsible. It takes in over the serial connection, like the foot desired XYZ positions. And it, you know, tells the servo suit of the angles that would make the foot go to that position. And I'll explain how the inverse kinematics model works in a second. Can um, I ask a and so question? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, so the Ross thing, so that Ross, I guess, provides um, some kind of framework for you to write these nodes and have them communicate with each other. Do you, like, how is the communication between the little processes here done? Right. So the way that Ross works is that you have like this this thing called like a Ross core, and it's like this process that you run 
regardless of what other nodes you're running. And then every other node that you make is either a publisher or subscriber. And so they either publish to a topic or subscribe to a topic. And so for instance, um, I have a controller, right? So I, I'll have like the controller and I'll have a node that does all like the Bluetooth interface and gathers and filters all like the joystick values. And then it'll output that to like a joy topic. I call it a joy topic. And then, you know, the trajectory generator will, you know, pull from that joy topic to figure out the joystick values to figure out, you know, what direction do I want to go in. And then it'll publish and pull and publish and pull. Got it. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it, it's 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 really nice. I mean, it's definitely overkill for this type of project, but it's really really nice, especially when you have uh, two different uh, processors that you can inter interface with each other. Um, and in this case, it was just, I mean, I had it working, but I, I really wanted to play around with ROS. Um, uh, now, I have briefly mentioned that um, you know I tell the leg to go to a certain X Y Z position, but how does like how do the motors like know what angle to go to when I tell it to go to an XYZ position? Um, and so that's done via the inverse kinematics model. So I ended up writing a small paper on my derivation for this one, mainly because if you don't account for offsets, right? So if you assume that your your joint act, rotation axis is the same as like the joint start point and end point, what you end up getting actually is a very simple set of like triangles that you solve. And you can say, okay, I want to go to this X, Y, Z, and um, I know my leg lengths. And so you can just solve the triangle and figure out what motor angles you need. Just think of it as a big triangle. But as soon as you add these offsets um, that that are really necessary because um, because of the, the way I designed the robot, I didn't want. I, there's no way I could have made them all on axis. Um, it actually it gets a little bit messier, um, and you end up with all these like intermediary angles, so you can solve it. But at the end of the day, it's just trig. Um, as tedious as it is. Um, and so, um, again, explicitly, the inverse kinematics model is directly responsible for converting like a foot's desired XYZ into joint slash motor angles. Um, and um, those are like the, the yellow thetas here. Now, um, at this point, you have to realize I was working on this concurrently. I, you know, I was working on the software concurrently with the mechanical design. So there's no really way, no real way I could have tested my my uh, uh, inverse kinematics on the dog itself and like validate that the foot actually goes to X, Y, Z. And so I created a quick, uh, you know, Python tool to visualize firstly the leg inverse kinematics. And you can see here the, the offsets are, are, are completely accounted for. Um, they're the little things that push the legs out. And then also to validate the body inverse kinematics. So I can tell the body, you know, rotate yaw and keep the feet planted. So I just rotate that, that body and 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 get the result in X Y Z, and you can see like the, the feet hold their position and the body translates, which is you know exactly what we want. So you can see here, you know, there's X translation, there's Y translation, there's Z translation. You also have yaw, and you have you know any combination of them, assuming your your servos can go to that angle. Um, and yeah. Hey Adam. Um, yeah. So all your computations are those happening on the microcontroller, or is this being pushed off to some other computational engine? Some so uh, I actually talk about it. I talk about it in the I, in the inverse kinematics paper. But uh, so the the inverse kinematics computations, like this trig part, that happens on the microprocessor. So the Teensy. Um, the higher level higher level planning of like what path do I want to follow and generating the foot trajectory that would give me the X, Y, Z values happens on Jets and Anna. Yeah, and, and, I, and I ran some like performance metrics and, and, and trying to see like how long does it take to compute these. And it's, it's really not that long um, on the TNC. It's, it's negligibly long for this type of application. Okay, thanks. Of course. And so um, generating the foot trajectory is, is a you know, whole challenge in of itself, in fact, MIT has this entire paper on, like, 12-page paper on, you know, why they generated their foot trajectories the way they did and what methods they used to generate them. And, and I did take some inspiration from them. And pretty much the idea is um, with, a, with a car, you know, or the differential drivetrain, if you want it to go faster, if you want it to turn, um, th those parameters that you have to change are very intuitive, like motor speed or motor speed relative to the other side. Whereas with a dog, if you want it to go faster, you know, there, there's like five different ways of making it go faster. I mean, you can just speed up the entire gate. Um, you can change the gate entirely, and that's what horses do, right? They, they either go from a trot or from a, a, a um, trot to a gallop, right, which is more efficient for different speeds. Um, 
or you can you know speed up parts of the gate and keep the others constant and, and there's just a whole wide array of possibilities and so um, their solution to this problem was to separate what they call the stance and the swing portion of the gate and so stance are when you're in contact with the ground um, and then uh, uh, swing are when you're not in contact with the ground and so the stance for, or sorry the swing portion which is here in, we could hear in black is um, a 12 point bezier curve and then the stance is they, they fit a sign uh, sign curve but I actually fit uh, another bezier curve because I they're using brushless motors, which are inherently compliant, but that's that's a whole other discussion in the end. Um, so they can push into the ground and their motors will fact, account for the fact that they're not actually lifting the body up. So there's a little bit of compliance. Um, and, you know, this is a little depiction of the Bezier curves uh, that I used. I mean, all Bezier curves look the same for this order. Um, and if you want to find out more about this, I think I, I gave a talk about Bezier curves before. Um, but it's really not too complicated. You're just linearly interpolating between the points. Um, and uh, I also implemented a Quintic uh, Hermite Spline version of this. I mean, it's the same thing, um, except the control points are different. And the difference is with a Quintic Hermite Spline implementation, the points you pick, the footpath is actually constrained to go through them. Um, and that helps when you're like in outdoors, when I was doing some outdoor tests, you wanna actually know where your foot is. And since these servos don't give me feedback, um, uh, that, that helped. Now, if you wanna move sideways or laterally, um, you simply rotate that gate uh, or that foot trajectory about the z-axis. And so here you'd be walking forward and you can see now it's moving sideways, but it's the same foot trajectory. Um, it's just rotated about an axis. Um, and this is this is a, this is is a preliminary simulation um, in PyBullet. I ended up using Gazebo actually, but um, PyBullet was nice to visualize these things early on. Um, and so what this will give me is I'll sample this trajectory and then it'll, based on like system time, and then it'll give me an XYZ, a desired XYZ position for each leg, right? And then I send those XYZ positions over to the microcontroller, our microprocessor, and that outputs the servo angles that I need. And then I tell the servos go to that angle. And I just, you know, run that at the highest rate that I can. Um, now, how do I time the gate? There's actually, <laughs> you can, a lot of people, they, or not a lot of people, a lot of like other robot dogs, they, they time it just like based on system time. Uh, but I found that do like a little bit of mechanical inaccuracy in my system and due to the fact that there's a little bit of like mechanical compliance, et cetera, my system would like spiral out of stability um, if I didn't actually synchronize the gate. And so I didn't at first I tried out, I tried some like four sensors and and you know they worked, but they're not as reliable as I wanted. So I, I designed my own. And pretty much um, this bottom part of the foot that's white here is um, TPU. And I have a super glued some mag three magnets that I embedded in here. Um, and then I have a linear Hall effect sensor, which simply you know, senses the magnetic flux um, or its output is proportional to magnetic flux. And so what happens is I can set a threshold here. Um, I can actually do a lot more than set a threshold, but I do set a threshold. And when, the mag when I press down, the magnets get a little closer to that sensor, right? And that sensor, you know, passes the threshold, um, and then I light up this LED to. This was for testing. I don't actually have the LED in the robot, but to indicate that foot contact has been sensed. Um, and so this lets me know, like, when this foot is down, so I can start the other foot. Um, this lets me know if I need, if I need to like flag a warning, um, or if I, I need to push deeper into the ground so that I don't topple over. For instance, if there's like a small ditch outdoors. Um, and also, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of using magnets and, and sensing, especially um, in encoders, um, uh, continuous in rotary encoders. Um, but here, I, I really didn't expect to be able to use magnets on this robot, but I found like a really nice use for them, which is, you know, low friction, um, uh, pretty much infinite lifetime foot contact sensor. Um, now, in terms of next steps, uh, this is an open source project that has like something like 150 um, stars on GitHub, which is nothing, but I'm um, pretty proud of that. So I just want to keep my uh, repository up to date. Uh, I actually have a Fuse version that I printed, or uh, let me correct, that Ryan printed for me and sent over. Um, and it looks so cool. The only problem is the parts are a little bit more dense than, um, than FDM parts. I think they might not even be more dense, it's just that they're printed solid. And so they're a little heavier. Um, and so I need to uh, get some stronger servos. Um, these kind of struggle to hold it up. Um, I, I I'm hoping to add visual orb slam via stereoscopic camera. So basically like 
simultaneously localizing and mapping the environment um, via visual markers um, so that it can, you know, map an environment and then I can talk to it to a point in a room and then it can find its way to that point in the room without me having to control anything. And then I have been a little interested in compliancy. Um, and since I have some sort of force feedback on the foot, I think it's possible to have some sort of compliancy. And you can see that the need for compliancy here when it's walking, it kind of pushes itself off the ground and rocks back and forth. Compliancy would let, like, let you eliminate that and have almost zero body acceleration um, or zero net body acceleration in the directions that you don't want. And then the reason I went with servos, sorry, I know I'm rambling on a little bit. The reason I went for servos instead of brushless motors is that servos, I mean, they're cheaper. Like this, the servo costs 20 bucks. Uh, a brushless motor counterpart with its speed controller would cost like, upwards of $150 per actuator. Um, so I'm, I'm saving up for and trying to work on a BLDC version for actual compliancy. Um, now, I, in the beginning, I did work on a branch project, which was to make a compliant joint um, and uses the same you know, linear Hall effect sensor and then embedded magnets here in series with the actuator. Um, and there was a spring around here um, so that when you push the actuator in one direction, they'll actually pull with you so that there's no like actual force on the joint. And then it'll like slowly decelerate so that you have like a limit to your, um, your compliancy. And so that was a pretty fun project. Um, oh, no, I don't wanna play that. And then if you wanna, <laughs> if you have any more information about the project or you wanna see more cool gifts, cause uh, I may have made way too many gifts for this. Um, there's the GitHub repository. Um, I'm working on a write-up on my personal uh, portfolio website. There's just, right now, it's just a bunch of links to other things that you can read and, and videos to watch. And then I also uploaded a bunch of videos about the project to um, my YouTube channel. And they're not like, <laughs> they don't have like a voiceover or anything. It's just like a, literally just a raw 20 second, a bunch of raw 20 second clips of the dog walking. I'm advocating for uh, Adam to uh, reformulate his, uh, his design for a single single build volume fuse print um, <laughs> because I think I think the like coolness factor marketing value of like you know push button get dog is uh, is pretty neat. Print pop. I think I it's, it's very yeah, much print, possible. Print pop. <laughs> it's very much possible because the since this was designed for FDM, all these parts here, like intermediary parts, are are separate. And so if, because fuse, I don't have to worry about supports or anything. I can just fuse some of them together and then it, it'll print easily. So it's definitely possible, yeah. This is so rad. Um, I have a bunch of like only semi-related questions. Uh, yeah, for sure. We'll probably, if anyone else has something uh, directly related to the technical side of things, I'll let them go first. Um, if not, uh, something I've always wondered about with um, quadruped robots, you mentioned trot and gallop as two different mm -hmm. gates, but I don't think I've ever seen any walking like as far as the way horses walk, uh, they leave three points of contact, um, shift mm -hmm. one leg at a time. Um, and then when you go to a trot, that's when you start to get the two points of contact. Right, just like here. Yeah, and so like, um, maybe I just didn't see it, but I'm curious about, about walking and presumably the challenges with shifting weight. So actually the, it's, um, in my experimentation, also like the general consensus is um, the more points of contact you have, the easier it is to walk because you have more static stability, so to speak. And so that crawl that you, I mean, crawl is keeping three legs and then shifting one leg and then shifting body weight and then doing the other. Um, that is actually the most stable. Um, it also happens to be the slowest. The trot is the next step up in terms of like speed efficiency. And then the next step up is galloping. But galloping really requires, like the, every time you go up a step, the need for compliance in your joints also uh, goes up. And so gallop, like kind of launching your body, you need compliance in your landing or else you'll kind of knock yourself over. Um, okay, so, but there, yeah, is, there is like a walk implemented there? Yeah, yeah. I, I okay. have a, um, a uh, crawl and a trot implemented and then I have a faster trot, which is less stable. Um, but I don't have a gallop yet because it's just impossible with, with non-compliant joint. I have a... Uh... A 16 month old baby uh, who has just learned is just learning to jump and he appears to be able to <laughs> leap but not jump so like he can in he can stand and he he can stand in one place and he can't get himself off the ground but if he like includes forward motion in his jump he is able to do it 
I've I've been trying Maybe to figure I'll, out why because it seems like it seems like jumping like static like jumping in place would be simpler, but maybe it's like coordinating the two legs together or something. I'm not I'm not sure. It's more of a comment. <laughs> comment yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. We'll, we'll I'll definitely do that. that. I, I I know in real dogs the front legs and the back legs are different. Um, is there an, an advantage to that? Like it looks like all your legs are the same. So the legs here are the same just to um, make my design easier. But what you'll actually see in a lot of uh, research robot dogs or like universities is that they flip these back legs um, so that their elbows are facing inwards. It's the same leg, it's just that the leg, like it's like that kind of. And the reason for that is here, the body weight is shifted back. All right. Um, and so, so I, I compensate for that by having like just normally, like nominally, the, the body is shifted forward by default to account for that weight offset or like weight discrepancy. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I would flip the legs if they, if the elbows wouldn't collide and limit my range of motion. Um, they have much bigger dogs and much slimmer legs. So it's not really a worry for them. But yeah, actually I have noticed that the back legs get a lot more wear, they get a lot hotter. Um, and that may just be due to my, due to my design, but yeah. Yeah, why would, um, I, why would they have more wear and get hotter? Well, maybe because my, my weight shifting isn't entirely perfect. And so there's a little bit of weight, extra weight on the back. And so they have to do more work on the front legs to um, keep the body up. That's generally, my I, I mean, that's, that's my hypothesis for why dogs generally have like beefier back legs. Yeah, but, my, my back legs are, are stronger than my front legs. For sure. <laughs> Uh, Adam, I see some, I see some like kind of gentle curvature in the uh, lower half of, of the legs, uh, and I'm, I'm curious, like, what went into making that topology, and like, is, is it, is it just like, yeah? Well, I, I'll just let you answer. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't have like an explicit like um, reason. I mean, I do have a reason for why I did it. I don't have explicit like evidence for why it works better. Um, I just noticed that when I made, firstly, when I made flat legs, they look worse. Um, but secondly, when you make flat legs, um, yeah, I guess it's, it, let me, let me pull up cat. Um, so here you see how, um, if I had straight legs right here, right off the axis, right. Um, and I tried to fold it all the way in, it would actually like get, it, it, it hit this little, uh, curvature right here. Um, and so I had to like either, I either make the legs curved so that they don't, so that they can tuck in all the way or that I have to like make the leg thinner than the upper arm so that it can fold in all the way. Um, ma mainly just so that it can fold in all the way. That's that's the main reason. Is that the... Um, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I think that answers it, thanks. Okay, cool. Um, oh, actually I have not seen this, um, Mark. Um, but this yeah, this cool. basically uh, the main research out of this was, this was like was was two part. One was uh, the dry adhesive that they use for the fingers, which is mm -hmm. as you increase shear, it, uh, normal adhesion force goes up, and it's like a basically they make it with indenting wax with a microtome blade at a certain angle, and then they cast silicone into it, and like, that's kind of cool, but. The other cool thing about this project is the way that they were doing um, sort of uh, the muscle tendon uh, structures here. So they basically have cable actuation from servos for the muscles. They have um, rigid cast urethane for the skeleton and soft, flexible urethane for the uh, like uh, tendons. And so this allows uh, weight to re to distribute nicely throughout uh, all points of contact on the robot. Um, yeah, I briefly, I didn't work on this project, but I briefly worked in this lab. Um, and I know that there are a lot of super smart people working on this for like a really long time. So there's probably a, a ton of stuff around design of um, compliant robotic yeah. uh, systems yeah. here. That looks really cool. Yeah, no, I, the, uh, in a lot of, um, in a lot of like hobby robot dogs, you'll, you, they, they try to simulate compliance by putting like um, elasticity or like springs in series. And, and that's kind of what I think is doing, it's happening here. So that's really, really cool. Um, also I see like the rib cage is like kind of looks flexible. Um, there's also dogs that do that where they separate the back half and the front half with another actuator. I just didn't have enough space or weight <laughs> to do that. Or, or, yeah, or I, I believe, 
I believe that it's flexible and there's a there's a cable drive through it. Um, oh wow! To enable That's like really the cool. wiggling, um, bunch of cool stuff. It's also just fun to watch it move because it looks more like a lizard than it looks like a robot. So it's cool. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you for sharing. Hey Adam, quick question. Um, so if you were gonna add a camera and video processing, um, would you have to change any architecture in terms of the Teensy? I mean, is it, do you think it'll still be uh, powerful enough? Oh yeah, it'll definitely still be powerful enough. I actually, um, uh, the, the Teensy, uh, the Teensy shouldn't have to do any of that processing. It would be on the Jetson Nano. Um, and so I'd, I'd oh, probably, yeah. I probably, I have the stereo camera so I can have like actual depth perception um, and I'll hook it up to the Jetson Nano, and then there's uh, probably a lot more reading and, and studying into um, um, uh, into uh, Orb Slam, which 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 is like an existing uh, method for simultaneously localizing and mapping via stereo cameras. Cool. Okay. Yeah, Orb Slam is very cool. Um, actually, I can um, I can pull up Orb Slam real quick. Um, uh, um, yeah, actually not, not this one. Um, they, they have a really cool like demo of what it actually does. Um, it's also very tiny, but pretty much you can like, the end result is that you should be able to like put like a 3D object in space because you know what your space actually looks like. Um, and the idea is uh, I want the dog to walk around and map an environment so that I can tell it to go to this point in space because it's mapped the environment. That's really cool. So do you have an ultimate plan for this? And it, I mean, so, you know, adding cameras and everything, you have an ultimate, like, okay, <laughs> tell us what, what the, <laughs> what your dog's gonna do other than being a pet. Um, so actually uh, I, I, I started off as just like a passion project, but um, there is a, 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 I guess I can call him a friend now, but someone who helped a little bit in the project in terms of like guidance was, um, this like Boston Dynamics, like new engineer out of Northwestern. And he actually ended up making one of these and published it in an IEEE paper. So like, there's like a little open quadruped atom like tag in the paper. Um, and he, he, him and um, Mark Raybert, so the founder of, of uh, one of the co-founders of, of Boston Dynamics, he, he, we had like a little call and he said that he thinks it would be really good like research platform, like low cost research platform for universities. And so um, right now I'm just getting into a state where <laughs> the open source <laughs> repo is a little bit more well-documented and, and, and uh, robust, but the, the end plan is just to make it open source and available to you know, universities to print and, and use or anyone to print and use. That's awesome. Thank you. We're, uh, we're over time. Um, okay. I think probably, probably probably good to wrap up. Do do maybe one or two more questions if if people have any. Um, this okay, has been cool. super cool, Adam. I okay. really uh... wait wait. Are we over time? Uh, we have till eleven thirty. Oh, oh, it's eleven thirty. Oh, it's eleven thirty. Oh, heck. <laughs> well, never mind. Please ignore. Please ignore me. I'm sorry. I'm all. I'm a thirty minutes off. It's all good. <laughs> um. Quick question around uh, uh, the gate um, mm -hmm. planning. Uh, I'm curious if you accounted for the changing contact angle or the contact point on the on the foot. And I don't. Matter. I I don't, but I really should. <laughs> the um, well, I, I guess it depends on what you mean by accounting for contact angle. The the way I was answering that question is um, where is that little? So I'm not sure if this is answering your question, but the the actual when I say X Y Z in space, I just assume it's this point. But in reality, since it's like a radius, um, yeah, yeah, there's that. a little bit of variation, like where the foot contact is and where I think it is. Um, is that is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'm curious if it matters or if it's just account. Like, do you maybe this sensor that you're using here to detect whether or not you're in contact basically bypasses that like error? Um, the, the sensor overrides the the system time, but it would actually be. Um, it doesn't override that error because the inverse kinematics model is what should account for that that discrepancy um, in positioning. Because if, if I think this should be where the this is where contact is, and it's actually contacting earlier than that, that means I'm depending on the foot contact sensor to always synchronize me, um, which isn't which shouldn't be its primary purpose. It should be like a catch up in, in the worst case. So actually, if I were to go to account for that, 
I just go about by not modeling this point as a, um, a point, I model it as, as a radius of, or a circle significant radius. Yeah, that's a great point. And then the other question I had about that gate is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, popular robotics, you've probably heard of Th Taylor Janssen, the guy who makes the crazy strong beast in yeah. small and the meat. He's, oh, got yeah. his special, he's got a special gate mechanism, or like a, basically a, a, a linkage that, that pretty closely reproduces the gate of most quadrupeds as if you were uh, in the, I believe it's in the, uh, the reference frame of like the quadruped moving. Mm -hmm. and, and so like, this is a different reference frame, frame indicated here in the MIT paper. I'm a little bit curious if you were to map it out, how close it, how close they come. Um, mm -hmm. I've always been told I, that, that that gate is like the perfect linkage or whatever for, but I don't. No, it definitely is. That gate is the perfect linkage. I would have, I mean, I, in my research, I would have, I was like looking at strand beats. I 3D printed like a little, quick little strand beats to, cause it was so cool and attached a motor to it. Um, but the, the main reason I didn't go for like a linkage design and the reason I went for a three degree of freedom leg with a servo on each joint is because I wanted to be able to do more than just walk. So I wanted to be able to you know, be able to sit or rotate and do all those things. And, and the strand beast would have kind of constrained what you can do. Um, but strand beasts are a whole different. They're so cool. That guy's like a genius. I don't know how he does it. Um, but yeah, no, I, I don't know what the gate, the resultant um, foot trajectory looks like. But I, I would presume it's pretty similar. I, I don't actually know though. Adam, can you talk around, um, you have now printed the same robot essentially uh, with FDM SLA and uh, SLS. Mm -hmm. Can you talk around like the differences in, and you know, what, what you would do differently for each platform or mm -hmm. you know, what were the advantages and disadvantages of each? Yeah, I, I would love to. So this is, um, so I, like I said before, I optimized the design for FDM 3D printing. So like I said before, flat faces for printing, so I don't have to worry about supports and then minimal overhangs. Um, again, so I don't have to worry about supports because they're such a pain to take off. Now, if I were to go for SLA, um, it's a it's a different, uh, see, I, the, the thing is about SLA, I'm not sure if it would be, if it would lend itself particularly well for this application, um, mainly because with this resin, I actually noticed that after like, uh, you know, about a week or two of testing with a clear resin, the, the lower leg kind of deformed a little bit and it's slightly more brittle than um, FDM parts. So I'm not sure I would actually pick SLA, um, but if I were to pick SLA, um, this actually ended up being printing pretty well on SLA, mainly because I printed it on this flat face that you can't really see here, like on the other side of this leg. And then this was all vertical. And since, you know, it's not a, a solid part, like in terms of like, there's like a hollow region in the middle, the cross-sectional area was not that bad. So I didn't get any print artifacts. It printed just perfectly fine. Um, uh, now the kicker is if I, if I knew I was designing for fuse, I would have much more intricate parts. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely pocket because it's, it, it's, I have to print it solid, right? So I definitely pocket to, to reduce weight. Um, but also this entire mechanism in the middle could have been, you know, easily like covered on both sides. So that would give me like more structural integrity here. And then I could minimize like the wall thickness. Um, it would look a lot cooler. Um, and yeah, I mean, the pulleys I use are printed on the SLA, on the fuse and, and they've been working great. So they're, they're more than high resolution enough to, to work. So mainly, mainly if I were self, to some- Self-dry lubricating. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there's actually a little part that slides in here. I don't know if you see that pocket. There's a little opening right here, and that's for the idler pulley to, to tension the belt. And um, in FDM, those parts, the tolerances are really small. Um, and so those parts would like fuse together. <laughs> in SLA, I also had that problem with a fuse. They just slid right past. It was perfect. Sorry, uh, I'm asking so many questions. If anyone else has, no, go ahead. Uh, please jump in. Um, I'm curious if there's any research in this field around um, adding basically, it's kind of cheating because it's no longer really biomimetic, but uh, uh, adding like a, a an actuatable like mass that you can shift around. So, you know, like just a heavy thing probably on like a, like a cable drive. No, I mean, the more in like the center of the body, you should, uh, maybe a tail. Maybe that's what I'm talking about. Like an about. offset weight. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like you, to, you could potentially use it to help like even like jump and stuff like that if you if you drove it hard enough. Um, maybe a tail does a lot of those things, but I'm just curious. Yeah, no, the, the, the tail is primarily what like in terms of like hobby robotics, that's the first solution people go to for that. But I did, that thought did cross my mind when I was designing. And if I had like any actuators that were more powerful than what I had, um, I would have I would have definitely experimented with that. But these these actuators are like by luck exactly like the bare minimum uh, uh, force I needed or torque I needed. So uh, if I had any more actuator power to play with, I would have definitely tried that out. But yeah, but they generally go for tails. Is that just because that's what nature does? Um, like yeah, as I much as so. I love biomimetics and stuff like there seems to be some like biological limitations to being able to throw your body weight around. So like yeah, maybe, that's why, that maybe that's why nature doesn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think it, I don't think a tail, I would go for a tail really because that's a lot of mass. Um, it's not that much mass and way more, like most people when they make a tail it's for like aesthetic purposes. So like we add like a few degrees of freedom so it looks cool when it waves, but it's not really that much mass to play around with relative to the robot. Adam, you know, to the same point, like uh, <clears throat> if you wanted to have this uh, do what dogs do, which is jump, as per Ryan's comment, <laughs> uh, like jump on couches or jump on anything practically, um, what what would it take to do that? Do you think the configuration of your legs and everything would support that motion um, other than just increasing the force of your actuators? So there are two main limitations to being able to do that uh, in the current design. Um, firstly, actuator power, or mainly actuator speed, not even torque. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, compliancy. And so I could theoretically, you know, push these servos to their limits and I can get a little hop. The problem is um, on the way down, I need compliancy to be able to recover from that. And I don't have compliancy here. Now I, I have tried to simulate compliancy with this sensor um, knowing because I can really estimate force based on magnetic displace, magnet displacement, but it's it's not as as um, uh, the 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 sensor output is not as like granular as 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 I was hoping it would be. So it's not that easy to sense force, even to map it to force is pretty nonlinear since I have three magnets in various locations. So it's it's um, it's possible like mechanically speaking. Um, and even like motor speaking kind of possible, but due to the fact that I'm using non-back drivable motors, it's just almost impossible. Okay. And I wonder if you, could use, if you could use like a beefed up O-ring drive instead of belts to allow for some like easy, easy drop in from the compliance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I know, I know people who use um, softer belts to try to simulate compliancy. Uh, the problem is it's not like, it's not as drastic as you might think uh, that compliance is um, be like maybe a centimeter to a compliance, not enough to actually have the compliance you need. Now, I, I, I did try to do stairs. I tried to do stairs, but I couldn't because of the, how small it was. Um, <laughs> you basically I, I really, I really put that point. Some tiny stairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other option. <laughs> One cool thing you could do is is build more than one of these, you know, two of them, and then have them work in cohort to, you know, like get on the stairs, like one sits down and one like sort of climbs up it. You could do all these cool things if you, you know, have more than one. <laughs> yeah, the boss of that was actually the guy with the orange one. He, he, I mean, once COVID's over, of course, we're planning to meet so he can try out some like group exercises. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you talk about compliancy in these uh, in in these actuators, um, it's it's not enough for the actuator to be uh, well. You, you can you can have basically the motors be back drivable, which is which is one way. You can also have compliance mm -hmm. in the in the actual linkages, but that's not mm -hmm. sufficient. Like you have to have that, and you also have to be able to measure it, right? Like, yeah. So um, it, it is sufficient in a sense that it would let you like recover. Um, it's just, it doesn't fit in with my software architecture and that I, I want to be able to dynamically balance and that involved in knowing exactly where my feet are. Um, right. And so the only way I'd be able to do that is if I had encoders on every joint, which I mean, I could do, um, but really it's not worth investing all this time in a servo. It'd be better just going to brushless motors where you can hit set like a torque limit um, and, yeah. and play around with that. Got it. Um, this may be 
very common and inane. I just don't know the field well enough. But um, with brushless motors, one of the cool things that I've seen in robots is that uh, BLDC outrunners uh, are like you can get. They basically it's like a it, it's even it's it's like a squared relationship torque with diameter, and it's actually even a little bit better than that um, if you're really driving them because of um, uh, thermal limitations. Uh, but what they'll do is they'll just get these like very very thin uh statters that are really really large diameter and they put all of their rotational uh you know like bearings and stuff like that uh, and pulleys sort of in in the middle of it and uh and you can get like some really really high torque uh to weight ratio joints there um anyway it's super rad so you're probably aware of it already but it's it's the next step and i've been trying to save up to get some my hands on some because they're so cool um the the torque versus like like that, that same ratio you described is insane with brushless motors um and it could be a whole other project in and of itself to make like a brushless motor driver um so I, that's the next project i assume you're familiar with the o drives mm -hmm. the o drives the problem with the o drives is that they're huge and um yeah, yeah each yeah. only drives two <laughs> motors you can uh, actually my make mind. a if you are really interested in tackling this project, reach out because I can put you in contact with some of the, uh, like the, some of the boosted guys that designed those uh, motor controllers and and uh, stuff like that. So. Oh, that's very cool. I didn't know that. I didn't know that boosted was responsible for those, uh, or boosted was indirectly uh, responsible for those motor controllers. That's quite cool. I'd love to love to no. talk about that. We did our own custom ones, separate separate from that. But oh, okay, okay. Now that's really cool. No, I'd love to. I'd love to. I'll definitely reach out. I'm thinking big motors because I'm automatically like in my mind, I'm just scaling all this up to something that can carry a leaf blower. <laughs> yeah. Or like a toddler on its back. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, if, I child. For, if I go for, um, uh, brushless motors, I'll definitely size up maybe two times size probably. Just cause it's actually plausible <laughs> with those types of actuator torques. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we should we should definitely uh, me... make make one to roam around at FLNC. Maybe we could write some <laughs> custom software where, like, if you you know drop food on the ground, it'll automatically just run to the food, it's like a real dog on it or something. And you can like be in the office without being in the office or something. <laughs> yeah, it would be probably like a very effective like. Uh, anti-robbery sort of like security system. Yeah, you're like, you're like a robber and you're breaking in and suddenly there's like a robotic dog staring at you. You're like, nope the heck out of there really fast. <laughs> Just put a huge speaker on it and then link it with a ring or something. <laughs> Just a bunch of like, um, you know, like black glass and red LEDs, I think would scare the hell out of me. I'd be like, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, no, I've seen too many Black Mirror episodes. I just want a more behaved dog than my current dog, Snowball. So if this can <laughs> behave, <better, laughs> that'd be great. Yeah, my cats don't like it. My cats don't like it at all. Well, I am curious about uh, the control loop and how it handles, uh, like, what do you call that, per per perturbance? How, when you when you knock it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm currently in the stage of experimenting with that. So it's not fully implemented. But the, the, the way that, so I, I briefly mentioned that I have, like, reinforcement learning, trained via simulation for dynamic balancing. Those are just a big, a bunch of big words to say. Um, over all of my control loops, I have a, um, a, a uh, reinforcement learning agent, which basically takes in IMU measurements or IMU readings in terms of acceleration in, in any direction. And then um, it, it changes the, the um, desired, so uh, let me explain. Um, so, so there's, there's thresholds, right? So if, there's, if the acceleration exceeds a certain threshold in any direction, it'll have to step out. But um, if, if you don't exceed that threshold, you can actually shift body weight um, without having to adjust your gait. And so there, that, that control logic, you know, supersedes everything. Um, and, if, and if it is needed to, to step out, there's another control loop that runs with another foot trajectory um, and gait planning for that. But that that's currently in progress. I'm, I'm having trouble getting it to work in simulation, which means it'll be a lot harder to get it to work in real life as well. Scary, scariest robot videos are the ones where like researchers are like sh violently shoving the dog, and it like keeps recovering, and you're like, quit, quit doing that, man! Like, 
<laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> They're going to get mad at us. Yeah, just pissing them off. Cool. This is so super if cool. you guys do have any more... Sorry? This looks super cool, really interesting. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any more questions, um, you can look at these resources or just feel free to reach out to me on Slack. I'd love to answer them. This is like a passion project, so it's fun to talk about. Um, and yeah, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time, Adam. This is, uh, this is great. And uh, of course. Uh, it's sort you. of a fun, a, fun break, uh, a fun break from the usual process topics, but sometimes you gotta, you gotta like step outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I appreciate really, the opportunity. Really cool presentation. Really cool. Yeah, super red. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> I, I am not ashamed to say that this slide took the most time. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that is that an actual uh, picture of the dog, or is that a render? Oh, it's a render. It's a render. Uh, it's a render. Okay. In, yeah. There no, there I was no, no, to play around with on shape. Oh, there's no nuts in the thing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you can see through the background. Yeah, this was this was done via on shape. So this entire project is designed in on shape as well. You really got that fuse that fuse color. Yeah, um, no, it was meant nail. to be. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you. See you guys later. Yeah, see you. So Ryan, oh, I think maybe Ryan. Now.